<laughs> so, uh, did I mention it? Things will be tweeted out. If you want to tweet something, use TF Dev Summit, and people can see it. A quick shout out to all the people who've joined us in viewing parties all around the world, literally. Um, it's awesome to have you all here. And of course, uh, with the live stream, that's not limited to physical presence. OK, I think I'm all set up. Um, thanks very much. I'm Martin Wicke. I, um, I'm going to talk about high-level APIs. And um, so really, <laughs> why would you do that? TensorFlow is perfect. Well, so if shortly after we released TensorFlow, really what got a lot of nice reviews, and then some of the things people said, well, it's really low level. And this is my favorite quote about this. You know, the first thing you realize of TensorFlow, it's really low level library, meaning you'll be multiplying matrices and vectors. Now, there's nothing wrong with multiplying matrices and vectors. In fact, um, it is one of TensorFlow's great strengths that you can do this at a very low level. It allows us to be very flexible. Um, you can easily combine TensorFlow operators to create any algorithm you can think of because they're at a very low level. You don't have to fit them together awkwardly. You know, it's very clear what a matmol does. It'll always be a matmol. Uh, it, it's used in many algorithms, so you can just use it to do whatever you want. Uh, it's also extensible. So you can re uh, recombine these, these small little packets of code in arbitrary ways. And then you can create new algorithms without having to change core TensorFlow, which is great. And so a lot of actually our Python API is built that way, where um, we have taken the op kernels or the ops and combined them simply in Python to create new functionality. And as you will see, we'll use it extensively uh, to make high level APIs. It's also maintainable. Uh, so we've had some, we have some history with this at Google, obviously, and, and other people have probably experienced this as well. Um, if you have large fused operations, they accumulate features. And as they accumulate features, they accumulate crud, and things go out of fashion, and you end up with these large, unwieldy um, pieces. And so we avoid that completely by having these small operations that are really timeless. Nothing much was going to change to a matmol. Uh, it's always going to be matmol, so that's great. However, of course, this also has advantages. And it has advantages for our users. And one of them is that we lack higher level primitives in uh, core TensorFlow if we only stay at this very low level. Um, and we, have, we, we may have um, all the tools you need to build your model, but you may be working at a level of abstraction that's actually not suitable for the kind of thinking that you're doing. And also, we cannot really publish out of the box algorithms this way. And this is why we are um, building a higher level API for TensorFlow. So starting in 1.0, we're creating this high-level API. We're building this API by taking components that have been built over time by other people. Now, the idea of building higher-level APIs, APIs on top of TensorFlow is not particularly novel. Um, so lots of people have done it. Mon much of that has happened in, in Contrib, in our Contrib uh, part, of, part of TensorFlow. So there's been TF Contrib Learn, TF Contrib Slim, um, SK Flow, which is integrated in TF Contrib Learn. And we're taking the pieces of those and making a fully supported high-level API inside of core TensorFlow. Now, what that should give you is you will be able to iterate faster over uh, model architectures or, in general, um, things that you may want to build with TensorFlow. Those higher-level abstractions will allow us to encode best practices for you, so it's harder for you to make mistakes. And we'll be able to provide primitives that will make it really easy for you to write code that's scalable right out the door. And you don't have to re-engineer it once you realize, oh, a single machine is not enough, or uh, a single GPU is not enough. And then finally, we'll prepare all of this code to make it really easy for you to deploy. So um, at the level of abstraction that we'll be talking about, you'll be able to say, OK, export this to serving, and you'll hear a whole talk about how to serve models later. Export this to serving, and it'll just work. That is the promise. So how do we do this? So this, you've seen this before. Rosat's talked about it. Uh, this, this is a very popular um, uh, illustration. And what we're doing is um, on the bottom, you have TensorFlow that you know about, the op kernels, the TensorFlow engine, and then the front ends that you're typically dealing with. And all of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are built on the Python front end. So 
The first step is to build a higher level of abstraction for building models, and um, we call this the layers. It is modeled after neural network layers, but it's not limited to neural networks necessarily. And basically larger pieces of uh, code that are grouped together in sensible ways. And on top of that, we offer Estimator, uh, which is a class that streamlines all of the things that you have to do to or in order to actually train and evaluate a model, which is uh, most of the work. The actual model architecture is usually not all that complicated. And for simple cases, you'll also be able, you're also going to be able to use the Keras model. And again, he, there's a talk directly after this one about Keras. And if you're interested in Keras, if you're a user of Keras, you should definitely um, wait for that. There's going to be a lot more detail. So for simple cases, you can use a Keras model. The estimator is a little more production-oriented or more for complex cases. And then finally, we have now this estimator interface, which is nice, and we can offer you models that are completely built out of the box, ready to go. And um, there's a number of talks in the afternoon that actually will talk about uh, how that, uh, what kind of models are offered and how they work. OK, so let me start by introducing layers. Um, so you've seen this before as well in, in Dandelion's talk. This is a, a convolutional network that is used for, well, this particular one, I think, is used on MNIST. Um, this is written down in a, in a way that you may see it written down in a paper. This could be an illustration in a paper, except for the color scheme. And our goal would be that you can write this network down in code without switching layers, uh, levels of abstraction here. So I want each of these layers in the neural network to be represented with a single function in my code. So if I have a convolutional layer, I want uh, there to be a convolutional layer function that does the same thing conceptually, and that I can just use and replace my illustration with some code. So if I have a convolution layer, a convolution function, if I have a pooling layer, I make a pooling function, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, I've added dropout. That's the only difference to the one that you've seen earlier, I think, because dropout is better. Um, OK, so now if you write your models this way, what happens is that you avoid a whole lot of cognitive load. You don't have to worry so much about, oh, I have to make variables. I have to call this function, that function, reshape. Um, all of this is done for you, and there's a lot of things that you probably wouldn't have done if you wrote it from scratch that are really useful to have. So again, you will be able to iterate much faster using this type of working, and then we, we introduce or we encode these best practices for you. And a big one is scoping. So you've seen that the graph visualizer actually uses uh, scopes to group nodes in the graph together, so it's easier to get an overview over big networks. All of that is done for you if you use layers. So each layer will show up as a little box. And only if you want to inspect the actual going on inside, which you probably don't, you have to move in. All the layers uh, support variable batch size. So once you move it to serving, you don't have to re-engineer your model because suddenly you don't have a batch size of 32, you have a batch size of 1. All these kind of things are things that um, are easy to forget, but we do them for you, so it's OK. I want to mention that all of these layers are compatible with Keras. So if you use a functional, one of these functional layers, that is, in fact, equivalent. In fact, the, the implementation is shared to saying, uh, use a dense layer object that is in Keras style and apply it to the same inputs. And you'll hear about this in the next talk. But soon we'll be able to, uh, we'll have a Keras module that is just completely compatible with the Keras API. And Francois will talk about this in much more detail, so I'll leave it alone. OK, so this now is, makes it really easy to build models, but models are really only a smar small part of the total effort. The real effort is to get them to train, and then maybe getting them to train in a distributed manner. And that's what Estimator is for. Estimator is an interface for, um, to abstract away what the actual implementation model looks like. So to start, let's consider a, a generic model. Any model, any machine learning model, will look somewhat like this. You'll have some inputs possibly labels if it's, uh, if it's supervised learning. There's some sort of model, and it produces predictions. Now, if that is trainable, then this looks a little bit different, where instead of predictions, you can also produce some sort of training operations. Often, this training operation is built on the predictions, but it's not necessarily so. And in TensorFlow land, what that looks like is that you have a train op that you call in the loop. And each time you call it in a loop, probably it's going to be feed a mini batch or absorb a mini-batch, and then update the weights of the model somehow. 
And we're not going to take a position on what that op looks like exactly, but it exists, and it's going to be run in the loop. Of course, if you're doing machine learning, you also want to evaluate, and while uh, for small or for simple cases, you can use the predictions to evaluate and just feed some test data into it, uh, in more general cases, it's very useful to have a separate evaluation graph or evaluation op that produces um, your evaluation metrics. And again, uh, because your evaluation data set may not fit in memory, you want to run this in a loop and feed it many batches. So basically, what we're saying here for estimator is that every model looks like this. And so we draw a box around it and we call it estimator. An estimator is really going to be configured using this model function, which effectively contains the code that you have written anyway, um, which produces this training of this eval of these predictions. But it's just a single function, you pass it to estimator, and then what you get in return is uh, a, an interface that always stays the same, and that you can write downstream, downstream infrastructure against. Um, and that takes away some of the work that you would otherwise have to do manually in every time you have a model. So in particular, it encapsulates all the information and all the necessary code about sessions and graphs, and it has the loops inside of it so that you don't have to write them. Writing these loops properly is error prone, and um, by using an estimator, you don't have to worry about this. You worry about what you actually care about, which is the details of your model. So there's one more thing uh, that we added, which uh, makes sense only in the, in the um, the context of TensorFlow, which is that you can export your model to a saved model, which is a data format that is directly usable in TensorFlow serving, which you'll hear about later. OK, so this, again, it encodes best practices. It deals with um, end of input exceptions. It deals with workers going down in a distributed setting. Uh, it, has the, it produces the right summaries at the right time, um, all these things. You can easily deploy it to serving by simply calling the export saved model and using that saved model on the model server. And it's scalable by design. So what you get for free here is if you have a model that you can distribute using data parallelism, this will simply work. And you won't have to worry about it. So now I will tell you about some models that we have built. And I won't tell you about the details. You'll hear about more about that in the afternoon. And I won't bore you with more uh, diagrams, but let's just see some code. So here is a more or less complete uh, piece of code that lets you write a linear model. It's a very simple model, linear model. Um, and you see the class name here is linear regressor, so that is one of our canned estimators. It is an estimator in the, in the is instance sense, but um, it has a slightly different uh, interface. It or it has the same interface, but it has a slightly different constructor. The only thing I have to tell this estimator is what, what inputs do you want? Uh, or do I want you to work on? And for this, we have made this um, declarative language to specify input data, which is uh, feature columns. And here, in this example, I just say, well, this model expects a thing called area um, is going to be a real number, and if you if you were to parse it out of an input stream of some sort, let's say a TF example, uh, the field it has in there is square foot. Um, or, yeah, square foot. Then there is another real number, and it comes, it, it, the name is num rooms. And then there is an integerized feature, which is really a string that I treat as an integer, and I know that it's never going to be higher than 100,000. Uh, that's the zip code. Now, inter feature integerization is, is a little bit um, it's, it's not entirely straightforward if you were to do it yourself, so you can think of this as a one-hot uh, vector that comes in, although it's not implemented that way because that would be terribly inefficient. Um, but again, you don't really have to worry about that. So now, all I need to do is, I already have, uh, um, I already have an estimator here, so I just have to call fit and predict on it. The interface always stays the same. Which is nice because if I want to experiment with different ones, I can simply say, oh, let me swap that out Instead of a uh, linear model, I want a DNN model, so a dense neural network. And then all I have to do is change the class name. And this is a more complex model, so it has actually some hyperparameters. And in this case, I can say, oh, how many units or how many layers do I want in this model and how many units should they have? 
And otherwise, it really stays the same. The only difference here, and it's worth pointing out, that you know, dense neural networks really don't like uh, getting integerized features directly or large one-hot features directly. So instead, I'm going to embed this. And again, using this um, nice declarative language for, for input specification, I can just say, oh, make an embedding column out of this integerized feature, and then, and then we're done. And this embeds it into eight dimensions, so it's very straightforward. Now, all I have to do is make sure that the inputs, input functions actually produce uh, features of that name, and I'm, I'm good to go. So the, really, the only question that remains is, what, uh, when can I have it? So right now, with 1.0, which, which I think should be released as of right now or something, I, I skipped the last 20 minutes of releasing this, um, you have layers in core. And, and the distinction between core and contrib is really in core, things don't change. Things are backwards compatible until release 2.0, and nobody's thinking about that right now. So um, if you have something in core, it's stable, you should use it. If you have something in contrib, it's, the API may change, and depending on your needs, you may or may not want to use it. So layers are in core, they're stable. Estimators and can estimators right now are still in contrib. We, we anticipate that we move estimator the base estimator, the custom estimator, into uh, core at 1.1. Can estimator will still be in contrib, and they will move to core subsequently. So in 1.2, we expect to have some of them in, and then there will be more, and we'll keep building more, and you'll hear about it in the afternoon, how many we have already. Um, traditionally, these roadmap, the, this, this, uh, these releases have happened six to eight, week, six to eight weeks apart. So that's kind of the timeline you're looking at. All right, and with that, I am done. And the next talk will be by Francois, author of Keras, about Keras. Thank you.